Dr. Peranto, thank you so much for joining us today and leading our journal session on gene editing. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's a great opportunity. Awesome, awesome. So just to get started with the first question, can you explain gene editing and how it's used to treat disease? So gene editing is a, a tool that's actually been around for uh, many years now. There are a number of different techniques uh, by which people have studied and are currently using gene editing. However, it's it's gotten a lot more excitement over the past you know, five to t ten years since the introduction of uh, CRISPR-Cas9, which is just one of the many techniques of uh, performing gene editing. And what gene editing is, is use these, um, these techniques or these um, uh, bacterial proteins, for example, in the case of CRISPR-Cas9, to alter the genetic sequence uh, in an organism's DNA in a site-specific way so that you could, in theory, uh, cut or change the DNA sequence uh, in a targeted way within, uh, within an organism's uh, genome. Um, it, it's garnered a lot of excitement because you could imagine it could be used to treat uh, uh, specific genetic diseases, for example. Can you tell us more about how the process works? Are cells taken out of the body or do you inject into the body? You highlight the two broad areas uh, by which it can be applied. So the, the first way which you, uh, which you highlight where in which cells are taken out of the body and then edit it using uh, gene editing machinery is called an ex vivo approach. Um, and that is something that's been actively investigated and um, there are clinical trials to use that approach to treat certain diseases that are uh, either uh, be, being initiated or have already begun. Um, the, alter the other way of applying it is, is an in vivo approach or in, in that approach the gene editing material is, is directly injected into the organism um, to try to target a specific organ or cells of a specific organ and correct or alter the genetic sequence of those cells. So there are two different ways. Um, I, I, would get, I guess I would say that the ex vivo approach has been uh, has been studied and is, is, uh, is some of the initial approaches to be used clinically because it's obviously a little bit safer and allows you to ask some questions by editing the cells outside of the body prior to injecting them into the body. But the ultimate goal is the one day to use both approaches. How do you protect against accidentally altering the wrong gene? So that is uh, an area of ongoing investigation um, and it is a very important question to raise before you ever think about applying this clinically. Um, you know, in the, in the perfect world, the gene editing machinery will be directed to the specific uh, site in the genome or in the DNA uh, that is causing the disease, and then you can edit that site uh, as planned to fix the, the disease-causing mutation. But uh, a consideration like you, uh, that your question alludes to is that that what if that gene editing machinery were to target a different gene or a different site in the genome? Um, and that's called an off-target event. Um, and so that is something as part of uh, most gene editing studies that is actively looked into. And there are, um, there are way, and the, I guess the one way to prevent that or to minimize the chances of that happening is, is related to how you design the uh, gene editing machinery. So for CRISPR-Cas9, there's a guide RNA that is used to uh, target the Cas9 uh, protein to the specific site in the DNA, and how the Cas9 is designed can increase its specificity to only target um, the site that you're, you're, you're interested in. Great. What are the ethical considerations of gene editing? So again, a very good question, especially as, as people are getting excited about the clinical application of gene editing. I think the biggest uh, consideration, or one of the biggest considerations, is like any other new therapy or new treatment, is you have to make sure that it is safe. Um, it goes hand in hand with your previous question with respect to ensuring that you're not causing unwanted mutations at, at other sites in, in the genome. And then there become uh, more broad ethical questions when you think about when the gene editing um, uh, approach is applied. And so a lot of therapies um, are applied after birth in adults or, or children. In the gene editing world, there's also interest 
uh, for good reason in applying gene editing before birth. And when you think about applying it before birth, there are, again, two distinct approaches. One is early embryo gene editing, and the other is mid to late gestation fetal gene editing. And so each of those different approaches, embryonic gene editing, fetal gene editing, and postnatal gene editing, all carry with them different ethical considerations. Um, and as you would expect, uh, the earlier in development you go, the, the um, the more uh, strong ethical considerations uh, become. When do you think before birth gene editing for disease treatment will become mainstream? I th in reality, I think, I think and I hope within the next five to 10 years. Um, we've been very fortunate to have, uh, to have done some pretty rigorous studies in mouse models, as have other groups uh, around the country which have been some of the initial studies of in utero gene editing to just demonstrate one that is feasible and possible and that it's, um, and that at least in the mouse model, it's safe. But these are just the initial studies and a lot more studies in the mouse model and in large animal preclinical models need to be performed before I or other people, I believe, would feel comfortable in applying it clinically um, at a human. Can you tell us more about your career path and how you got interested in this line of work? So I'll be completely honest with you, I never, uh, 20 years ago, I wouldn't have said I, I want to be a pediatric fetal surgeon with a research interest in prenatal gene editing. Um, it's been a, uh, a series of uh, decisions along the way that uh, are somewhat unexpected at times. When I was in college, I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. and. You know, halfway through college, I, I realized that I uh, had a deeper passion for m wanting to work with uh, people. And so then in college, I decided to apply to, to medical school instead of uh, veterinary school. In medical school, I thought I would have a significant research component to my job, which in the end I do. But, uh, but during medical school, there was a period of time where I became very interested in surgery, which is a long um, training path. And at that time, I didn't see how a research career could fit into that. However, in the middle of my surgery training, I took two years off uh, and did research, as well as a year off at the end of medical school. And I was uh, fortunate enough to work with Dr. Flake at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia here. And that research uh, on in utero stem cell transplantation to treat congenital uh, blood disorders like sickle cell disease really got me excited. And I, and so then at that point, I decided I wanted to go into pediatric surgery and I wanted to make research a ma major focus of my, of my academic life, my professional life. And so I, I finished my training and I was very fortunate to be able to stay on staff here at CHOP and they've been very supportive and given me the resources to continue um, uh, to explore my interest of prenatal therapies for congenital genetic and, uh, and hematologic disorders. And that together with the recent explosion of interest in, in gene editing over the past you know, three to five years has, has kind of uh, propelled me into uh, what I think is, is a very exciting area of research and what uh, many of us here at CHOP think is the future of what a fetal uh, therapy will be you know, 10 or 20 years from now. Great. Thank you so much for joining us today and thank you so much for leading our session on gene editing. We really appreciate it. Oh, it was great. The students were awesome. I very much enjoyed it.